Hello and welcome. Well, a groundbreaking book has been published called The Synodal Process is a Pandora's Box. The authors are both highly respected Catholic academics from South America, and it has a striking and powerful foreword by Cardinal Raymond Burke. In it, he calls on all Catholics to resist the processes of synodality because he and the authors claim that this synodal project is intended to actually change the faith of the whole church. Jose Antonio Oreta and Julio Loreda de Utze claim that they're trying to wake the church up to the scale of the emergency, an emergency that's taking place both in the West and inside the Catholic Church. And they're warning the church that both the secular culture is an imminent of being de-Christianized and worse, that this movement is also going to de-Christianize the church itself if it is allowed to be introduced by what is a Trojan horse of synodality. Well, they've written this book with simplicity and clarity because they've discovered to their great alarm, and quote, that not even the bishops we've spoken to are aware of all that is at stake. This may surprise a lot of people, but it's not easy to keep up with the speed of cultural change. And this is made a little bit worse by the fact that many of us can now easily live in our smaller cultural uh, internet and geographical bubbles where if it's not we ourselves who are being cancelled, the seriousness of the soft totalitarianism that is overtaking the West might pass some people by, including some bishops. But if the bishops are really not aware of the intensity of the growing threat to the church, well then it follows it's unlikely many of the laity are either. So, the authors are trying to write in a way that alerts the hierarchy, alerts circles of Catholic intelligentsia and the common faithful, if one can call us that, about the heterodox serpents and lizard inside the Pandora's box being opened, they say. Well, this kind of language might strike some as unreasonably alarmist at first sight. So, to make their case as accessible as possible, they've written the book in a form of question and answer in a way that's really quite familiar to a catechetical style to help Catholics work out for themselves what's really going on, what's true. In their book, they carefully explore the strategy that lies behind the Snowdle process, what it represents, what it intends. But if I may say so, what may be lacking from the book is an overall conceptual analysis of what's happening to secular society and what may happen to the church. And what I want to do is to fill in a bit of the part of the background to that here. For the process behind what Cardinal Burke describes as a revolution is actually using a heady mixture of sex, Marxism, and what we might refer to as Orwellian doublethink, confusingly wrapped together to turn the traditional ethics of Catholicism upside down. Now, readers of the book will obviously want to examine these claims carefully. What, for example, is doublethink? Why is it being used? Let's go back to George Orwell's dystopian classic 1984, which has so accurately and astonishingly foretold much of what we now experience, for it gives us the key. Doublethink there is, quote, the act of holding simultaneously to opposite, individually exclusive ideas or opinions, and believing in both of them simultaneously and absolutely, end quote. Double think requires using logic against logic, or suspending belief uh, in the contradiction between the two. So in his novel, the Ministry of Peace concerns itself with war, the Ministry of Truth with lies, the Ministry of Love with torture, the Ministry of Plenty with starvation. And the three slogans in Orwell of the party are War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Well, the contemporary DIE agenda reflects the same contradictions extraordinarily. In contemporary terms, diversity really means non-Christian uniformity. Inclusion actually means excluding Christians and traditional values. And equality actually means taking revenge on those who hold Christian views by cancellation 
Or worse, every passing day, the news tells us of Christians who've been fired or cancelled for having views that do not align with the values of etc. etc. Well, Orwell warned his readers that the aim of this particular kind of madness of doublethink is to intend is intended to ensure that an increasingly brainwashed, pop, brainwashed populace is no longer capable of recognizing contradiction. And in the present political and cultural fog where politicians are too scared to rely on biology when asked what a woman is, and where trans activists can launch violent attacks on ordinary feminists, our secular culture appears to have reached that same paralysed place where contradiction can't either be managed or even articulated. Our present philosophical struggle across the Western world involves cultural or new Marxism replacing the ethics of what was Christendom, the foundations of the integrity of the individual and the priority of compassion that Jesus embodied and taught are being replaced with collectivism and hierarchies of power, power relations. We might observe that politicised power relations have replaced compassion by smuggling themselves into public favour, by pretending to compose of a heady and attractive mixture of niceness and justice. And the public have largely brought into the idea that to be woke is to be in favour of a refreshed social justice in a nice way, and that this is a good and worthy thing. So social justice is now defined as a restitution of the so-called alienated and marginalised, rather bizarrely working through a prism which sees sex as all-important in the way we understand things. The challenge for the Church, which Cardinal Burke in his foreword in Loretto and Loretta, in his new book Warn Us Of, is that not only are we losing the battle for Christian values in the secular state, but, astonishingly, discovering that within the Catholic world, the strategy of the Amazonian Synod and the Snowdal Way are replicating the secular goals of undermining and redefining Christian faith and ethics. But this time, within the Church, inside it, as well as outside it. The irony is that the Church itself tried this once before, and might have been thought to have learned from its mistakes. In the 1960s and 70s, when I was young, an earlier economic version of this was attempted in what we called liberation theology. It was very exciting and heady. Strangely, this is all happening at the moment when parts of the church that tried that experiment have finally woken up to the realisation that flirting with Marxism in liberation theology actually destroyed the church and faith wherever it was practised in South America. It's left devastation behind. For example, Leonardo Boff's brother, Clodovis, like his brother, a former liberation theologian, has recently written a heartfelt analysis of the way in which this adoption of Marxist categories favouring the alienated turned out to be wholly destructive of Catholic integrity and ethics. It failed disastrously. So how is it that we discern within synodality an assault on the Church's ethics and beliefs? Well, we see the use of Orwellian doublespeak, represented in the values of D.I.E., inflicted on us. We discover there, too, the replacement of the integrity of the individual with a preference for talking about the collective. We find that sin is less important than inclusion, that compassion and forgiveness have to give way to the dominance of, yes, power relations. But there's also perhaps puzzlingly the further element of the centrality of sex at the heart of the agenda. Why has the classic focus of alienation, alienation shifted from economic categories to the categories of sex? Is it just part of the louche degeneration of our culture? Maybe part of the growing pandemic of the addiction to sex that pornography has unleashed behind the privacy of the computer screen? Or, and or, Perhaps it's part of a strategy. It has become impossible not to notice that the consequences of the secular project that synodality is copying have been the diminution of what is scornfully called heteronormativity. 
and as the value of heterosexuality is questioned, so too, inevitably, is the status and functioning of the family. Catholic spirituality of the last century has been rightly alerted to the prophetic warnings that flowed from the Marian apparition at Fatima, and whatever we make of them, it's increasingly hard not to acknowledge the Sister Lucia's summary that the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family has a profound and growing contemporary resonance and relevance for the Church. This is made even more poignant and alarming as having watched the ferocity with which Marxist regimes attacked the integrity of the family during their years of dominance in communist states in the 20th century, we now find ourselves asking, is it really possible the church may be preparing to sign up to a project that appears to be trying to achieve exactly the same goals as the Marxist totalitarian state to take states by stealth, which were once attempted so ruthlessly by force. Cardinal Burke, in his forward to the new book, insists that's exactly what's happening. He says, Synodality and its adjective synodal have become slogans behind which a revolution is at work to change radically the Church's self-understanding in accord with a contemporary ideology which denies much of what the Church has always taught and practised. If it's true that both our, both our bishops and thinking Catholics, the Church in general, has yet to grasp the character of the alleged strategy of the present turbulence, then reading this book, The Synodal Process of Pandora's Box, may be an important task for all of us, as the authors believe it to be. Both Cardinal Burke and, more recently, Bishop Strickland are just two of the more prominent voices warning each of us that we're facing a civil war in the church with people who want to change what Christ taught, to subvert the church the apostles founded, to undermine the principles that Catholics from the struggling laity to the martyrs and the saints have lived and died for. The first thing we have to do is to call the assault on the faith out for what it is. And after that, our responsibility is for keeping the faith, keeping faith with the faith, and fighting to defend the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church and what has been taught in all places at all times. Soli Dei Gloria.